And this is in my family. This was a bedspread that my grandmother did. And when I went to her town in Sorrento and visited with some relatives there, they were using them as a, a, a curtains with another curtain behind it. And their grandmothers, which were my, my grandmother's sisters, um, all had the same motifs but each was designed differently. Because typically Italian, they learn all the different piece, uh, uh, technique and the different designs, but God forbid they would do it like their neighbor. You know, if you've ever asked an Italian up in uh, 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 Milano uh, for a recipe for their lasagna, they'll say, oh, this is the best. And then you ask for the recipe in Florence and it's totally different. They go, they don't even know how to cook in Milan. Then you go to Naples and they go, no, no, we make the best lasagna. The same with the needlework. So it was so interesting to see this, that they each had, when there were two others, they had all these mo motifs, but very different. So this was a, a bedspread a part of the trousseau. You can see the little cherub in the center and all the beautiful cut work. Next. 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 And then what I love when I go to the little towns, and sometimes in the big cities, but especially in the little towns, from north to south, if you look up, you'll always find beautiful needlework on, on the windows, on the curtains. And I just thought these were just lovely. And I met the lady who did them all, a punto tagliato, um, a, a, a cut work, just lovely. Some of them now you can buy them machine done, but most times you'll see beautiful handwork done on the windows. Next. And then I had the good fortune of, this is Ricamo Bianco white work, to meet this lady who was doing work at home. She, this is a tablecloth she was embroidering last year. It was half finished, and she was working on a big quilting frame in front of her window. It was wintertime. It was February when I was there, and this is in, uh, in Tuscany, outside of Florence, and she works exclusively for a shop in Florence, and this was a tablecloth with 12 napkins, all in this beautiful white work, uh, being done for an English nobleman in his family. And again, look at how beautifully they have done uh, the shadow work, the raised work, and open work, so that you get this beautiful sculptural feeling. Next. This is a very old piece. Again, when I did the exhibit, this piece comes from Sicily, and it's the top of a wedding sheet for the matrimonial bed. And uh, when I was trying to press it with the curator for the exhibit, we just marveled because talk about being a sampler of stitches. Um, I could have spent a lifetime studying the whole uh, length of the, of the sheet was all done and it was all buildings. And we thought how interesting. And the curator was saying how this was definitely this woman who must have been inside an architect. She was creating and building with her needle. And then it has sayings like uh, Concordia, agreement, you want to have agreement in your marriage, felicita, happiness. But look at how fine the linen is and all those threads are pulled. And once again, you can see the beautiful balance uh, between the open areas and all the patterns and then the raised areas. And so this is well over, this has to be around 1900. Next. This is another corner of it. Uh, it says, and then a few years ago, and if some of us were in the class, um, a wonderful young woman, Adriana Armani in Florence, who comes from a long line of embroiderers in Florence, and she gave us a class. And I love this piece. I, don't, I didn't include it. This was a top sheet, but without the sheet. And it's called uh, Il Rovescio. It's the top part. And this is an extra one you do. So instead of having to iron the whole sheet, you just place this iron piece that's beautifully embroidered on top. I thought that was the most clever idea. And that dates back to 1900. And she taught us many of these stitches. But again, look at the beautiful uh, raised work on it, white on white. The Italians have always loved the classic, you know, white on white, natural on natural. Next. And a very beautiful tablecloth uh, done by a friend in Florence that sh she sells and guarantees that you can put this into the washing machine with cold water, no dryer. Next. And you can see a close-up of how lovely you have the shadow work, the raised work, uh, the stem stitch, uh, the punto rodi, the road stitch, the punto principesa, the princess stitch. Next. Filet done all over um, Italy uh, because there's so much coastline. And 
I love this little piece because I love the little tassel dolls below. <laughs> and when I was a little girl uh, with all the neighborhood children, um, my mother and grandmother used to keep us busy on the front porch by stitching with us uh, with all their leftover threads, all the boys and the girls in the neighborhood, and making these little dolls. But again, I, I marvel because I can hardly get all of my stitching done. Can you imagine if you had to make the netting first? So this is all hand knotted and just the darning stitch. Next. And of course, the most famous town for the most sophisticated um, fillet is tr found on the west coast of uh, Sardinia, the town of Bolsa. And that's where this piece comes from. And I find this uh, magnificent, these two um, uh, wonderful animated animal, uh, beasts with the tree of life in the center. And that's all done with the darning stitch on handmade knotted fillet work. Next. And here's a close-up of it. Next. Now this is a piece of the same work, hand knotted fillet, the darning stitch. But this piece was done in Tuscany, outside, a little town outside of Florence. And they refer to it as Modano because the Florentines and the Tuscans like to be different from anybody else, so they don't call it <laughs> fillet work. But it's the same type of work, beautifully done again. A look at the simplicity of the border at the top and bottom. Very lovely. Next. I think we have a close-up of it, yes. And you can see the darning over and under. <clears throat> but just the thought of having to make all of that knotted netting scares me. Next. <clears throat> now, this looks like the same thing, but this was done in the countryside. Peasant work, I don't like to use, but that's what it was, done all over Italy. For years, it was very hard to find this type of work, burrato. Now you find it all over. And the difference between this and filet is that this area, this strip, was done on a small loom, hand-woven, just like this other fabric that was done on the large loom. And so it looks like a knotted, um, a twisted canvas thread. And so that's the difference, using the darning stitch once again. And because these were pieces done out in the countryside where they didn't have access to a lot of the, or could afford the beautiful silks and uh, elegant tassels that you'd find in the city, they did not waste any of the thread and this purse is over 100 years old, they would use all their leftover threads to make these wonderful knotted tassels, which are the rage once again in Italy. Next. There you can see the bag. Next. And a close-up. Good. And here's a piece, and I have this piece with me uh, today. And this is called The Stitch of Catherine de Medici, Punto di Caterina de Medici. And it's only just that we have a stitch named after the great patroness of, of the arts. Remember, it was Catherine who grew up in Florence who left there to marry Henry II in 1533. And if you know your English history, her daughter-in-law was Mary, Queen of Scots. So Mary learned her needlework from Catherine, who's from Florence. And this is very much the rage um, uh, done today in, in Italy, especially in Umbria. So I know the ladies will have lovely uh, pieces. Next. And it looks like um, it's very similar to a backstitch, but with an extra twist in there. So make sure when they're demonstrating, you learn how to do it, because it's just beautiful. And the name comes from Borato, this very coarse woven fabric in the back. Next. And once again, a close-up of the knotted tassel. And every region will do a knotted tassel differently. Next. Well, we have Armida wearing, I only saw that this morning when it came in. I don't know how they pack these. <laughs> but Tiziana and the ladies with her. This is called Ars Panicalensis, which means art from the region of Panicale. Panicale is a beautiful little town uh, where lots of the English have summer homes and retirement homes on Lake Trasimeno, which is the lake near Peru in the center of Umbria. And um, they do beautiful, they have a beautiful museum. We were just, I was just there a few months ago and they were having their last lesson. And the women of all ages, young to old, are doing this beautiful embroidery on netting. Now this netting is commercial. This is not handmade. And traditionally it was always white work. But again, they've decided, you know what, we want to make it contemporary. So I just saw this hat today. There's one of the students made this beautiful hat. First time seen. And then I can't resist. 
they told me I should wear this today by lecturing. I would be too distracted, but I, I'm going to try it on later on when there's a mirror. Is that not gorgeous? So again, I'm going to show you. This is a traditional piece from the museum and a non-traditional piece. So it's very exciting to see them combining both the past and the present. And I, I just saw it. So this, is this not magnificent? And then uh, there's a piece of jewelry here that's, and I thought this was an antique. See, they could fool me. They could charge me thousands, of, not that I could afford it, but uh, tell me it was thousands of dollars because I thought it was antique. And Tiziana, no, just done. Isn't that beautiful? So these will be up here for you to take a look at. This hat is made of video, so. Oh, a wedding or? Uh, we, at, at, in my church in Sacramento, there's one lady, a very attractive, tall lady, young woman, and she wears a hat every Sunday. I'd blow her mind wearing that, wouldn't I, <laughs> one Sunday? Uh, <laughs> After I left New York, and I still have cousins there, this is many years ago, but uh, we had gone to Catholic school there, and um, uh, in Cardinal Spellman, so that tells you the date a long time ago. And then I think the Waldorf story, it took over his residence. They sold it. And uh, we went to have high tea um, at the, uh, the Cardinal's residence. We couldn't think of anything more exciting to do as Catholic girls to go to the Cardinal's and have high tea. And then we decided we had gloves, but we had to buy hats. So we went, my cousin's a character in New York City. We went to a secondhand shop and bought big, you know, feathery hats. And we had high tea where Cardinal Spell <laughs> used to be. I just thought, I'll always remember that. And so that would have been perfect to wear. And they just brought this down again. They do, they love dressing the children for christening. Um, if you've ever been to Italy, I think the most beautiful clothing in, in the world are, is still in Italy, yes. So this is what they're doing there presently. Okay, I didn't mean to sidetrack, but I had to share that with you. Next. Now these, this is more traditional work, but beautifully done. And we were just there, it was their last lesson, so we asked lots of questions. Some were working on black um, uh, netting, commercially made. Some were working uh, with a silk thread. Some were working with cotton threads. Others were working with wool. Uh, some were working on cotton netting, um, fine netting, uh, gross large netting. So they're doing lots of different things. But the technique is always the same. But no two ladies were doing the same thing. Everybody doing their own. The most beautiful, and she was helping with the, um, with her teacher was helping her. She's doing a veil. She has three daughters in her family. And so the veil was from there to here. And they had it on brown wrapping paper. And they were just sitting there darning all of these be beautiful patterns. And they've done beautiful uh, books on the subject. Next. Well, again, we always have to talk about drawn thread work because the Italians like anything that makes it look lacy, it makes it look elegant. And this is a beautiful old bath towel um, saying buongiorno, good morning, with big fringe on it and this beautiful uh, drawn thread work, punto spillato in Italian. Next. Reticello. This is a sleeve of a dress from around 1890, a, a friend shared from Venice. She kept one cuff and she gave me the other. And you can see reticello, again, an early form of lace making. The needlepoint lace didn't come until uh, towards the end of the 15th century in Venice. So this was a precursor. And rete in Italian means net, ello at the end, a little net. And it's always based on geometric, diagonal lines, a horizontal, vertical. Uh, and there you see the picots. So I know definitely it was made in Venice. Next. A very special piece. This is reticello. It's a lovely pillow. You can see the lacing on the side. Um, and this was done down in um, the Sorrento area. Uh, not by my family, unfortunately. But I have the exact date and the purchase price because I was lecturing uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. And about um, two years later, I got a letter from a lady saying she was breaking up her home, moving into retirement center, and she'd be happy to sell me some pieces. And I only wanted this piece, but I had to buy her whole box. And she actually had the pieces that her parents, when they were on the trip, the uh, receipt. And so these were bought in Sorrento. And what's so rare about this piece, if you show the next slide, I can show it to them. Next. There's a boat. You always see the figures. OK, so this was probably being done by a young woman whose husband-to-be was a fisherman, but actually the boat. So it's, a bare, it's the only piece I've ever found with a boat. Next. 
Amelia Ars, okay? Once again, we see the word Ars, which is the Latin word for art, art from Amelia, the region of Amelia Romagna, which is above Tuscany, um, and it's the center is Bologna. And uh, here they do, again, needlepoint lace, but God forbid they would do it like the Venetians. So they do it their style. And Bologna really is a very artistic city, has a very rich heritage. Unfortunately, it's overshadowed by its neighbor, Florence. So Florence gets much more press. Um, but it's beautiful, and I always remember our special visit um, to the museum. They had finally, after so many requests years ago, finally had a show at the main museum in Bologna of Amelia R's work, and I had heard about it that it was extended. And we were there, I was there with a small group, and of course it was a Monday, a state museum, it was closed, and I thought, I cannot believe this happening. They have this beautiful exhibit. And because the curator had written to me a few years before, and I gave her names of people in Bologna, she did not know who had beautiful pieces. And when my friend in Rome called her saying, you know, Vima's there, she would love to go bring the group in. The minute she heard my name, she said, oh yes, because she wanted to thank us. And so Mike was with me. We got to go and see the show while the museum was closed. We had it to ourselves. So this is Amelia R's. It's needlepoint lace done in their way. Next. And here's a piece. They work it not on a pillow, but on um, cardstock weight paper and with a piece of transparency um, like parchment over it, they stitch the outline down and then they fill it all in with again the detached buttonhole stitch and then they remove it from the paper. They don't use a pillow. Next. This is a very rare piece that one day will be given uh, to the LA County Museum. It was done for one of the founders of the Amelia R. Society, the Countess Lina Cavazza, and it was done by the ladies for her. When one of my clients bought this, it's a brooch that goes around the neck. It was on black velvet ribbon that the Countess wore. And you can see the diamonds around. But look at how lovely and exquisite that piece is. All of your detached buttonhole, the tree of life, here it's the vase of life, and the birds drinking from it, the grapes. Next. For the same a Countess, the ladies did a beautiful crib cover with the um, coat of arms of her family in the center. And so you can see reticello all around, uh, the needlepoint lace in the center, the raised uh, punto reale, they call them, uh, patterns in the center, and on the outside is bobbin lace. Next. Next. This, again, was a very popular piece, and there's a close-up of the center work. Next. Okay. And of course, around 1900, they even did, I got to see the slipper, they even did wedding slippers. And uh, there's a beautiful small museum in Florence, um, uh, the Ferragamo Museum, right, where the uh, Ferragamo uh, Palazzo is, and they have changing shows, and it's very interesting. In the 50s, he has a half a dozen uh, beautiful summer shoes, all done in needlepoint lace by the local ladies outside of Florence, and they're on display. Next. Now this, my photo, because I was so overwhelmed that I only had one shot to take it. Uh, this, I got to see the real tassel. There is a picture of it from the book, which is clearer. But this is very rare, and my friend still owned and shared with me, like she said, she kept it in a, jewel, in a jewelry case. It was so precious. And these are the type of elaborate tassels they made in Bologna for Amelia R's work. And you can see the grapes, the leaves, uh, again, the birds drinking from the tree of life or the flowers. And this is all done with a detached buttonhole, but in the style of Bologna, Amelia R's. Next. And again, the Tuscans are not going to be outdone. So this is the antique, I usually say the antique Tuscan stitch or punto antico. And once again, the Florentines are not going to do anything like their neighbors did in Bologna or in Venice. So they do a little bit of the needlepoint lace. They do the raised stem. And look at the way they use the bullion. Never singular, always double, which gives it a totally different effect. And then bobbin lace around the outside. And uh, the punto sfigliata, the Florentine pulled work around the outside. Next. And this for them was a contemporary piece. I bought this 
uh, one of my first pieces as a student, so over 50 years ago. And for them, this was contemporary because they weren't doing white on white or acru on acru. And so to make it more contemporary, they started using color. And uh, this is a table runner. And I loved it not only for the design, which was so typical of the antique Tuscan stitch, but notice the beautiful corners with your detached buttonhole. Next. And on the right hand side is the back side. And on the other side is the right side. In fact, we were talking a few uh, before you came. Um, I did a, sh a small show of antique pieces at the University of California, Davis, not far from where I live. And it was a new young man who was a curator. And he did a beautiful job of putting it all up. And it's about a half hour away from where I live. And the opening, the big opening, was going to be Saturday night. And I said to my husband, I think I should run over. And he said, oh, no. He said, you know, he knows what he's doing. And you know, I just like to go. And good thing I did, because every piece was uh, on the back side. It, they were, <laughs> we had to repin the whole show, because they were so, he couldn't believe it. They were so beautifully done. And this is a typical example. Next. <laughs> 